Dr. Rebecca Tortello, who over the last seven years have been the education specialist at UNICEF Jamaica. She also lectures at the University of the West Indies in the Department of Education on the Mona campus. She has worked with the Jamaican government as a senior advisor consultant to the Ministry of Education, directed the Spanish Jamaica Foundation, served on numerous boards, including the Early Childhood Commission, the Jamaica Commission for UNESCO, the Jamaica Library Service, and also the Institute of Jamaica. She currently serves on the National Commission for the Prevention of Violence and the National Education, Education Transformation Oversee Committee. She has a PhD in education from Columbia, master's in education from Harvard, and her bachelor's from Harvard as well. Dr. Tartello, we speak about books, Caribbean books. Well, Dr. Tartello has written a Jamaican book called Pieces of the Past, which actually several children's pictures and books and other several children's picture books, and she edited the early childhood commission, several early childhood uh, books as well. So we speak about Caribbean materials, Caribbean things. Well, she's one of the individuals who have started that process as we move towards looking at what we have within the Caribbean and how we can do this. And I'm going to introduce Rebecca and uh, hand Thank over you. to Rebecca at this time. Thank you, Cecile. Can you hear me? I yes. hope. Yes. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, appreciate the support in sharing my slides. I'm sorry that I cannot show my camera. My laptop crashed this morning and I am borrowing my son's desktop. I'm not an expert in his desktop and I'm having glitches. So I, I'm grateful, Alicia, for your support. So I'm going to um, pick up where a little bit where both of the previous speakers uh, have left off to some degree or in some way, shape or form by sharing with you some of the highlights of UNICEF Jamaica's partnership with the Early Childhood Commission over the last, I would say the ECC has been around now for almost 20 years. So we've been involved with the ECC from the inception and the ECC, just so um, everyone knows what it is, is a multi-sectoral body um, enacted by parliament through the Early Childhood Act, Early Childhood Commission Act, and it oversees, regulates, monitors all of the early childhood institutions, public and private, in the country, which amounts to about, the numbers keep changing, but something like 2,400 institutions of varying sizes and locations. And the ECC actually, um, when I say multi-sectoral, it means that it has, uh, it is comprised of representatives from the key line ministries where children's issues are housed, so health, education, um, in our country, labor, social security, as well as persons who to the minister uh, who the minister considers uh, have expertise in the in the sector. Ministry of Finance is also there. Uh, we have a National Parenting Support Commission that they are also represented. And the commission um, oversees the work of the ECC, which has promulgated standards of operation. There are numerous inspections carried out every year. There is um, a lot of work that's done along five strands of what the ECC calls its national strategic plan, which this is about, no, please don't go from that side, sorry. I'll, I'll ask you, I'm still here. Um, the NSP for ECD, that's the acronym, works on five key strands that go across the life cycle of a child and are very much aligned to the global WHO survive and thrive framework. Um, so parenting, early screening, identification, referrals. Some of this was referenced earlier by previous speakers and um, curriculum development, curriculum assessment, teaching and learning, capacity building of our teachers and parents and partnerships. The ECC meets quarterly with its partners of which UNICEF is just one. And we all try to make sure that we're all aware of what we're doing to support the NSP's implementation without stepping all over each other so that we can maximize uh, our resources because these resources are getting scarcer and scarcer, or that's not good English, are getting more and more scarce. Um, so I'm mentioning the NSPs. So UNICEF has been a part of that. We're also trying to help the ECC finalize its policy. Normally a country does a policy first and then does its NSPs as an action plan. We did it the opposite way around. That's another story for another day. As I told you, parenting strategy is one component, one strand, and so UNICEF has supported the development of the NPSC itself and a strategy called Parents Places where 
schools, libraries, community spaces, and even now digital with digital innovations, which I'll mention later on, such as parent text, give parents a chance to access resources and get some help and support along their parenting journey. Teacher training remains a key part of UNICEF's work. And a lot of this is around um, child-centered, experience-based, locally developed uh, interventions such as the IRI Classroom Toolbox, which came out of the Caribbean Institute Care, Caribbean Institute for Health Research, um, and is um, inclusive, discussion-based, and violence against children focused. Um, I mentioned early screening identification referrals. So Jamaica has a national system of this actually that begins with the child health development passport that every baby for the last 10 or 12 years receives. That passport is a, is a screening tool if used correctly. We're still working out how best to use it and trying to digitize it so that the data from the passport, which is supposed to be transferred when you enter early childhood institutions into primary school, et cetera, um, can be accessed in real time. Then there's an age four assessment, all children are observed by their classroom teachers at four years old, which is a key developmental milestone age. And those who meet a certain cutoff uh, are okay. Those who do not meet it are referred for a diagnostic assessment that has been adapted culturally and validated called the Ages and Stages um, ASQJ Questionnaire Jamaica. UNICEF has supported the entire development of this and is now looking at helping the ECC to further support the children after they're, they're given the secondary assessment with the development of framework for what they're calling individual learning support plans and um, digitizing this entire process so that it speaks to the Ministry of Education's work to create a digital education management information system, taking the various ways in which the ministry currently collects data around the island on paper or on Excel sheets into a more standardized, easily accessible form um, format. Another area that is emergent is of course, climate action, climate change, disaster response, and the psychosocial first aid that goes along with that, which of course the pandemic has uh, highlighted for all of us and particularly for our young children, it, they're not left out. There's issues around toxic stress in early childhood and ways in which you see this image here on the screen of an early childhood practitioner playing with um, the child, with the student, and the fun and the just priceless, priceless exchange taking place there. Next slide now, please. Thank you. So in UNICEF Jamaica, unfortunately, Jamaica is one of the countries with the highest, one of the highest rates of violence in the world that is not a country that is at war. Um, it's something that affects all aspects of UNICEF's work, affects all aspects of, of um, our national development. We've just run a new multiple indicator cluster survey. This data is from the last one, but it's pretty much the same. It hasn't really moved very much. We still, corporal punishment, unfortunately, is still something that is uh, practiced in our system, but not at the early childhood level, or it's, it's um, not lawful at the early childhood level. It probably is still practiced, but it's against the law at the early childhood level. It is not against the law after age six, which is something UNICEF continues to advocate um, to change. Next slide, please. So back again with VAC and ECD, same slide. I love that slide because of the connection between the child and the caregiver. Um, one of the ways we're working on violence against children, which is a cross-cutting issue in our um, country office, is working on policy assistance, but also scaling up of the IRI toolbox. So we, I mentioned it before, you can find it online at iritoolbox.com. And on the slide, you'll see all the different elements that comprise IRI Classroom. Um, it's low cost, it's scalable. Um, it involves teachers and parents because there's the IRI Classroom and the IRI Homes component. And the focus is on positive behavior management, child social emotional competence. A lot of it is through discussion and play. And there's an foundational literacy and numeracy component. And Professor Helen Henningham and her team who developed the ICT have scaled it down to two, one and two year olds because we have a number of daycare or what are called brain builder centers now being um, attached to our institutions and scaled it up to grade one because there's that key transition between in our system age five into age six when they move from early childhood institutions into full public funding at grade one. Next slide, please. So more about IRI Toolbox, um, and you can learn a lot more on their site that I'm telling you here. I've listed here for you. Um, it's really a support, it's to, to try and create this supportive, nurturing environment, but it's geared at building um, a lot of 
connection between the teacher and the student, but also building vocabulary and awareness. That's why I keep, you keep hearing me say discussion-based, as well as facilitating social-emotional regulation, which are issues that we've seen in our classrooms and issues that Professor Henningham and her team deliberately set out to gather data on and then to craft an intervention. And then they, of course, they did um, uh, studies to test the impact of the intervention and they were positive. Next slide, please. It's gonna be more about IRI Classroom to give you some examples. And here's what I'm mentioning about the evidence base. There were two large cluster randomized controlled trials. And what we saw as a result were large reductions to teachers use of violence, which means physical violence and verbal violence, shouting, screaming, criticizing, and benefits to teachers in that they were happier at school themselves because by increasing their ability to manage their classroom and the behavior in the classroom, they were able to do more, spend more time teaching and the children exhibited more pro-social skills. Next slide, please. I mentioned Irie Homes. So we've, we've, we're have we trying to get to the stage where we will be able to begin implementing Irie Homes on a broader scale. The best way to do that is to build on the um, experience with the Irie classroom trained teachers and have them be the conduits or the link to the parents. So we are in the, po in the, in the process of doing um, an evaluation of the Early Childhood Commission's administration of IRE Classroom so that we can now begin to scale up IRE Homes even as we continue to scale up the IRE Classroom approach. Next slide, please. And I think you, this is an example of some of the tools that already exist for IRE Homes. So there's checklists and there's a lot of time and effort um, spent with parents to try and increase parental involvement, increase quality time with their children, and reduce the tendency to resort to any form of violence. Next slide, please. So here are some of our achievements. Um, we've trained, the ECC has a cadre of development officers. There are 101 of them. And they are the ones who conduct the ongoing professional development for practitioners. So this is about leadership, leadership at the central um, organizational level that trickles down to the principals and then to the teachers. We've trained 840 early childhood practitioners across the island that accounts for about 10% of the cohort across around 30% of our institutions. And all the training, because of COVID, the training became hybrid, which makes it more flexible, but also requires perhaps you could say a different type of monitoring. Um, Irie Homes, we've done a little bit, so a little bit of work has been done with, with Irie Homes, but we need to do more. Next slide, please. So there's additional um, work that UNICEF has been doing in parenting support. I've mentioned some of it, which is the National Parenting Support Commission and just its existence. And it does a whole raft of um, interventions around parent mentors, the parents' places, um, and parent education. Materials for parents and facilitators for those who are working with parents, which is the second column. Parent text, which I mentioned, which is a chat mechanism that works via WhatsApp. That's a partnership between UNICEF and Oxford University and was being trialed in Jamaica and took a lot of the global messaging. So basically you sign up and you say, I have a son who's four years old. And then every few days you get a text with a suggestion on what you can do with your child. And the ECC also has a first thousand days app, which talks about the, the importance of those first thousand days and gives parents strategies that they can use. Um, we're working on helping the NPSC to create a website that all of its work would lead to and would be an easily accessible resource for parents and parent education. Next slide, please. So the way forward, I mentioned we're trying to evaluate the IRE Classroom full program implementation and scale up. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm really only highlighting a few elements of our work because I know there's a time limit. Um, a lot of this is available on UNICEF's website. But what you see here is a snapshot of some of what I was mentioning before, which is our work around early screening identification and referral. We're trying to move from the segregation, uh, a system of segregated uh, classrooms at the primary level and secondary level to a more inclusive one. Many of our classrooms at the early childhood level are the most, in most inclusive because they are mixed ability if the children are going to school at all. So we're trying to get uh, parents who have children with disabilities to feel comfortable sending their children to school by upskilling the teachers that are avail that are present in the sector to be more aware of mixed ability instruction and the different tools that are out there to support them, such as the passport, such as an updated directory of services for children and families. I mentioned to you the age four assessment. 
we have a course that is um, through the University of the West Indies called the Child Health Development Therapist course. It's not currently active. We're trying to make it active. Um, we have an inclusive education or special education mixed ability course that the Early Childhood Commission runs um, for practitioners. It's online, asynchronous, free to access. And we have been working with the ECC to leverage partnerships with uh, local foundations such as the Digicel Foundation to upgrade targeted early childhood institutions to include therapy spaces in certain model or early childhood institutions around the island so that the children after they're assessed with the age four assessment can go to these spaces for interventions and stimulation and the parents as well. That's a work in progress. We have about four or five, we have many more to go. Next slide, please. So the next steps around um, this sort of uh, portion of our work with the ECC is to help finalize the ECD policy and make sure it, it references uh, strategically and fulsomely the early screening identification referral pathway, scale up the inclusive ed course I just mentioned that's online asynchronous, create more of these sensory spaces which are really grounded in the concept of play and play therapy, try to digitize the Jamaica School Readiness Assessment locally called the age four, make sure that we're monitoring the implementation of another element along our early screening identification and referral pathway, which is a family at risk screening tool, which is conducted at our health clinics and the creation of an early years care and support task force that works cl more closely with the early childhood commission, which would help to make sure that all of these efforts around inclusion and that lines of communication are open between health and education, which sometimes they aren't as open as we would like them to be. Next slide, please. Um, this is unfortunately a very blurry slide, but this goes to some books um, that we've been working on and references um, Sec Carey's, uh, Professor Carey's uh, speech presentation, sorry. So these are examples of the Literacy 123 series of about 12 to 14 books that were developed by local authors with local illustrators that were made available in all classrooms, grades one to three that were digitized by a Jamaican company called Book Fusion. And that with funding from our regional office, um, we have been working to make them accessible. Accessible means that they're digitized, they can be available on and offline, but they have sign language embedded for all of the words that are on the page. Um, they also have audio of the words on the, on the page, on, but they also have audio descriptions of the images on the page, their activities that are embedded in them. And these, all of what I'm talking about comes from a process called universal design for learning which is linked to a global treaty that Jamaica and other countries have signed called the Marrakesh Treaty, which is encouraging all publishers and creators of content for children to consider and include this universal, the universal design for learning principles in their work, making the books available for children with and without disabilities to use in the same classroom. So we are almost done with converting our 12, 12 books in this Literacy 123 series. It will go up on another um, free to access platform on and offline which is called the Learning Passport, which will be able to work specifically in its first phase uh, in grades one to three on foundational literacy and numeracy, which we are still reeling with recovery, learning recovery from the pandemic. And we want to make sure that we get it right, right from the start, or we do better to get it right, right from the start. Next slide, please. Another um, type of leadership effort that we've been promoting is a partnership with our National College on Educational Leadership, which is the entity that trains and provides ongoing professional development for our school leaders at all levels of the education sector. We created a child-friendly schools course, which is the most popular of NCEL's offerings right now. It's again, online asynchronous, free to access, and it's based on the principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And it gives examples of child-friendly schools initiatives within our local setting. So it doesn't take examples from any other country. It takes examples from Jamaica so that school leaders can see that these kinds of initiatives and this kind of change that's more child-centered is possible. Um, these, this course and the accessible digital textbook work, even the ESIR pathway, everything that I'm saying is applicable across the English-speaking Caribbean. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna to transition to the emphasis on play. And this is the last part of my presentation. Play is something that is actually a very, very much a cross cutting uh, intervention in UNICEF country offices around the world and in the work UNICEF does in its over 190 countries. Um, why? Because it, it 
play is part of education at all levels, play is part of child protection, play is part of health, play is part of emergency response. Um, yet, we don't really track the benefits of play. Play is easy to scale, easy to teach. You don't even have to teach it, right? It's easy to replicate, I should say. It's low cost and its impact is long-term. Next slide, please. So, and of course, it's a core right of all children. It's the way a child learns what no one can teach him or her. Next slide, please. So we've been trying to push play and a play-based approach to teaching and learning. Our Early Childhood Commission has taken this on board. And for example, they've declared February as their month of play. And every week they promote play-based activities. The curriculum itself is play-based and the curriculum goes from zero to five. Um, we celebrate a day, um, well, I'm coming to that slide. These are just some stats, global stats from the Lancet about, child, about play and the impact of, of what play could reverse these, these statistics, these dismal statistics. Next slide, please. 15 minutes of play can spark thousands of brain connections in your baby's brain. This is something that I would like, I would hope and dream, and Cecile shares this dream, that all of our teachers and the early childhood sector understand this and actively promote playful teaching and learning. This is why we say early moments matter and play helps to give us access to quality education. Next slide, please. Just another little, you see the children playing on the right, you have some of the key things I'm talking about. It's actively engaging, it's iterative, iterative and it's interactive. And then mostly, most importantly, it's meaningful and fun. Next slide, please. It matters, it always matters. And we should really make more time for play. We get caught up with our children sitting down, filling out workbooks and so on. When one of the most valuable things for them to be doing is what is happening in this picture here, is to play with each other, play by themselves and become immersed in that moment. Next slide, please. It's cost-effective, scalable, because it builds on their own interest and motivation. It teaches teamwork, it teaches patient, important life, patients, important life skills. Right, next slide, please. So I mentioned that the ECC uses February as a month of play, but we also celebrate actively Play Day JA on the first Tuesday in February. This year it was February 7th because it's recognized as Global Schools Play Day. Why do we promote it in schools and not necessarily in communities? Because Jamaica does not have very many family-friendly spaces. When we were doing our urban planning and design, we forgot the playgrounds. It's uh, something we hope to to fix and change as more awareness is being given to green spaces. Well, we want more awareness to be given to playful green spaces. And in that sense, maybe we would get to the stage where we could celebrate in communities as well, but we also want to promote more play-based teaching and learning. So we're happy to support the Global Play Day movement. And we also know that just this week, the UN General Assembly has declared June 11th, the International Day of Play. So there's more and more global recognition is coming back to play as a core right and a scalable, um, low cost, uh, highly impactful intervention. Next slide, please. I think I must be almost done. This is a picture of one of our play days. This was a wonderful little boy who I met at Halfway Tree Primary. We had just played that uh, secret telephone game, right? Where you send a message and what you send, what you start with is never what you get back. And you know, with that type of activity, <clears throat> you can teach basic vocabulary, building, nouns, verbs, you know, parts of speech, et cetera. And the kids just had a great time. Next slide, please. I'm also gonna flag for you another game-based teaching and learning, two more game-based teaching and learning interventions that include early childhood, but also go a little bit beyond, which is EduSport. This is the, we this is the website which has the EduSport manual, which are short games that can be used in class, out of class, by PE teachers or coaches or just classroom teachers that focus on literacy, numeracy, and life skills. Next slide, please. Which we have trained PE teachers around the island um, to use. Similarly, we have this Play at Home kit, which is available on our website, which focuses on parents and gives parents strategies and games that they can use at home, and also a game-based interactive learning guide which we did for grades one to three tied to our subject content in those grades, which is again, relevant across the English speaking Caribbean. The sites are on the slide, which I'm sure will be shared. Next slide, please. Almost done. This is one of our recent play days. 
These blocks come from a company called Imagination Playground, and I absolutely love them. They happen to be blue. They happen to be UNICEF blue. That's just a coincidence. They are um, easy. What is it? They, you can clean them. They are easy to clean. They're non-toxic. They come in all shapes and sizes. You can use some. You can use all. Um, the, the kids just have a fantastic time, and I don't need to tell this audience how much critical and creative thinking, how much they're building their critical and creative thinking skills. We're trying to work out a project to move these blocks around the island and use that as a way to advocate um, for more family-friendly play spaces, as I was saying, in each of our communities. And we're using our school leaders as advocates in that, um, in that effort. Next slide, please. So all of this is about trying to build a community of support. So. We have manuals, we have materials like the blocks, and we provide technical assistance to our Early Childhood Commission. Next slide, please. I'm moving, coming to the end. So another resource that uh, people may find useful is a global hub for parenting information, which goes by, um, the, it's done by age level. Uh, you can see on the right of the slide, on this, um, on this site, you'll see activity suggestions, key to the ages, You'll see some mini, I think they call them mini classes, where um, experts will speak about different uh, issues in early childhood, uh, positive growth and development, such as toxic stress and how to combat it. So it's useful for teacher training. It's useful for parenting sessions, just sharing it as a resource that can build leadership um, around the issue of, of strengthening the relationship between home and school. Next slide, please. And lastly, recently, as I mentioned to you, we're working on this Learning Passport platform, which is a global UNICEF innovation partnership with Microsoft. And one of the things we did was work with Digicel Foundation, which is a big supporter of early childhood and inclusion on the island, to create this corner shop challenge where you see five activities for children under six, five activities for children over six. And they helped us dis distribute it to 100 corner shops where they sell credit around the island and we're, we've been doing social media pushes. We did a reel that got something like 210,000 views um, where a parent was engaging with her child around some of these questions, trying to remind parents that playful teaching and learning can happen anywhere at any time with you don't have to have a lot of fancy toys or gizmos. There's a QR code at the bottom right hand corner and that QR code takes you to the learning passport where you can sign in and get access to additional learning opportunities. Next slide, please. Lastly, I'd like to plug the Lego Foundation. I'm a big fan of the Lego Foundation. On this site, there are a lot of courses around play and play-based learning that are short and easily accessible and relevant to, I think, child-centered, quality-based education. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> That's it.